Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. In this video I want to talk about simultaneous language acquisition, that is the scenario in which we have a child who acquires two or more languages from birth onwards, that is a case of first language acquisition where we don't just have one first language but rather two or even more first languages. The ideas that I'll talk about come from chapter 6 of Grosjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism and I want to start with a stereotypical idea that many lay people have of bilinguals. So the stereotypical bilingual uh, would acquire two languages from birth where both languages are spoken by different family members. So maybe you have a mother who speaks Spanish and a dad who speaks Korean and the child then grows up hearing and learning these two languages and the acquisition would be perfectly balanced so that the child is able to express any idea in any situation in any language. Now such people of course exist, but we have to realize that there are in fact a small minority of all bilinguals in the world. For the purposes of this course, we've defined bilingualism in a much broader way, saying that a bilingual speaker is a speaker who uses two or more languages on a regular basis in their day-to-day -day lives. And this means that bilingualism can actually take a variety of shapes. Um, and even if we look just at bilinguals who acquire two languages from birth or during early childhood, even there uh, bilingualism may manifest itself in very different ways. The causes of bilingualism can be very different. So the stereotypical scenario that I outlined where families where we have one parent speaking one language and another parent speaking another, but there are actually different scenarios in which young children may also come into contact with different languages. So let's think for instance of immigrant communities where only the minority language is spoken at home. Yeah? So there's a home language and there is a community language that is spoken in the environment. Now as soon as you have friends or uh, other people coming into the home or the family going out, um, doing going about their business uh, in the city, the child will hear that, oh my gosh, there's a different language and when my parents speak to those guys, they are using a different language. Yeah? And as soon as they have friends, as soon as they're in kindergarten or at school, uh, basically all of their peers will be speaking a different language. So that's another way in which a new second language may enter the life of a child. <clears throat> uh, likewise, they, there are multilingual communities where virtually everyone speaks two or more languages. So different languages in these communities are spoken in different contexts depending on the business that you have. So also in this context, the child would realize sooner than later that the parents use a different language when they are doing different things. So maybe even they use the same language all the time to their children, yeah? uh, but nonetheless the child will discover that there are other languages at play. In short, um, there are different ways in which children may come across different languages. It needn't be the one parent, one language uh, family model. And so this means that there are different ways of becoming a bilingual, there are different ways of being a bilingual, and we need to be aware of that. Right, another distinction that we need to make is the one between simultaneous language acquisition and successive language acquisition. So in short, the question, are we are dealing with two first languages or are we dealing with a first language and a second language? And if you want to, you can pause the video here, get a piece of paper and write down a few notes of your thoughts on this issue. So how early does the second language need to come in for us to justify the label simultaneous language acquisition. Is it from birth? Is it one year after birth? Three years? What about a seven-year-old child who moves to a different country, goes to a different school, hears a different language? Is that still simultaneous? Or is this child acquiring a second language? Yeah, so you can pause the video, formulate a few ideas, and come back to the video once you have that. I'm going to continue right now. So there's a traditional view that has been expressed that sort of draws a line in the sand and says after two to three years of age we 
no longer talk about simultaneous language acquisition, but we rather call this successive bilingualism. Okay, that's a term that you can give to this phenomenon. Most of the literature views this a little critically and instead argues for a continuum view. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to put two bilinguals in different categories just because we have one bilingual who started the L2 at two years and 11 months, and then we have another one who started at three years and two months. If you've been around young children, you will know that not all children speak their first language in exactly the same way at uh, two years and a couple months. Yeah, So there are vast individual differences. And this means it's really, really hard to distinguish where in your language career a child is at any given age. So speaking of age may not even be the right scale in order to make this distinction. So bottom line, we have to be careful distinguishing simultaneous and successive acquisition, but it's hard to point to a precise point where we go from simultaneous to successive language acquisition. Here are a few useful uh, terms that we'll use. So uh, BFLA, that's bilingual first language acquisition. That's a label for the uncontroversial case of simultaneous language acquisition. Here we have a child learning two languages from birth onwards. Um, the term BA or bilingual acquisition <clears throat> can be used for everything else if you like. So bilingual acquisition from the first year onwards. And uh, different researchers have adopted different terminologies with regard to the different languages that are acquired. So some have opted for um, calling one language language A and another language language B. And still others have argued that, well, this sort of implies a hierarchy, uh, making language A the more important one, and that's undesirable. We want, don't want to make this uh, decision in an a priori way. So uh, you'll also find the terminology language A and language alpha, indicating that both of them are first languages and not one being the first, one being the second. Other terms uh, that you'll come across in the chapter are passive bilingualism, where um, bilingual children, well, they tend to go through a phase, at least, where they reject one language and produce only the other. Yeah? So this is a funny phenomenon that many parents uh, report that at, at some point, you know, the, the, the child is going through this rebellious phase and only uses one language. Um, so that's passive bilingualism. It's called passive bilingualism because even though the child refuses to use one of its languages, it still understands what's being said in that other language. Another term is replacive bilingualism, and this is uh, often the case with adopted children who speak one first language, maybe even monolingually, up to a certain point. Uh, then they are adopted, they come into a new family, and the new family uh, speaks a new language and doesn't speak the first language that the child had been learning up to this point. So what happens then is, of course, that the child picks up the new language uh, and uh, no longer uses, no longer has any occasion to use the first language that was learned up to that point. Uh, so the child may even forget that language, um, well, at least consciously, because subconsciously structures of that first language remain. So there are interesting studies showing that, for instance, the phonemic inventory, knowledge of the phonemic uh, distinctions in that first language, they remain. So let's say that you are a child, you uh, spoke German up to your third birthday, and then you were adopted by Spanish parents, and so you grew up speaking Spanish, you will still be able to make all the distinctions between the, the, the funny German phonemes, even though you don't know any German words or German syntax or anything like that. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Replacive bilingualism. <clears throat> we also need to talk about the logical problem of language acquisition. So this is an important argument that has been made a lot in the context of generative grammar and the question, how is it that kids are so darn good at learning languages when they suck at basically everything else? Yeah. So the basic observation is that kids can learn uh, 
language easily, effortlessly, and use language very proficiently at an early age when they still cannot do many other things that we would think are rather easy, like tying your shoes or remembering the way to the train station, multiplying three and five. These things are not things that um, you could trust your four-year-old to carry out. Yeah? So if you send them to the train station at that age, you're probably not the greatest parent in the world. But at the same time, these kids can talk. Yeah? So they can use relative clauses, they use their tenses, and uh, if you've ever tried to learn a second language, you know that this is kind of a hard business. Right, so that's the apparent contradiction. How is it that kids can do this so effortlessly? And um, the conclusion, of course, in generative grammar has been that there must be some kind of head start that kids get. There must be something innate that uh, allows children to pick up language. Um, <clears throat> if you've watched other videos that uh, I've, I've put up on my channel, you know that I lean towards a very different kind of philosophy. Uh, so if you look at the research done by people like Michael Tomasello um, or Elna Levin, um, you'll find that there's a big literature that takes a usage-based approach to first language acquisition that explains this apparent contradiction in very different ways, namely with the kind of input that children get. Okay, um, what remains is that language learning is difficult and learning two languages means there's twice the challenge because you have to learn double the amount in sort of half the time because, um, well, <clears throat> you only get to listen to one language at a time. So that means you have half the input that you would have compared to a monolingual child. And this may explain in part why many, uh, many children from bilingual households choose to speak just one language at a, you know, during a phase of passive bilingualism. Usually they end up speaking both languages just fine, but they go through a phase of passive bilingualism. Okay, um, I've mentioned input um, and, uh, well, the stereotypical idea of a bilingual would be to have a person who hears 50% one language and 50% another. That is sort of the ideal case, um, which in actual life rarely uh, happens in that way. So most bilinguals, in fact, have a dominant language and a non-dominant language, depending on uh, the people they interact with and what languages they use. If you think back to the first video in the series, I mentioned the complementarity principle, that you have different languages for different domains of life. Now, a baby doesn't have that many different domains of life, yeah? but they still have different caretakers that they interact with. And so it stands to reason that the more time they spend with a caretaker in a given language, the more proficient they will become, the quicker they will, will become proficient in the language of that caretaker, which results in a dominant language and a non-dominant language, language A and language B. Um, so the dominant language will have a greater extent of use. The child knows more words, <clears throat> uh, is better acquainted with the phonemic inventory, uh, has greater proficiency in that language, and um, we'll talk about transfer in just a minute. So transfer will be more likely from the dominant language to the non-dominant language. So the dominant language has a greater likelihood of influencing the other language with regard to pronunciation, lexical choice, uh, syntactic patterning, so word order is being transferred from the dominant language to the non-dominant language, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a result of the relatively unbalanced nature of input that we find in most bilinguals. <clears throat> a big question that we have to talk about a little bit is the question whether bilingual language acquisition really means that you build up one integrated complex system that has both languages in one network, so to speak, or if you have two separate cognitive systems, you know, one Korean, one Spanish, 
and they're kept relatively uh, discreetly apart. As you can imagine, people have argued for both extremes and everything in between for that matter. And uh, the position that we'll come down to in this video is actually a kind of in-between compromise position. So right now, no one really argues for the extreme case of having everything be one single cognitive system. There's simply too much uh, empirical evidence against this kind of view. However, there are serious arguments in favor of separate cognitive systems. So uh, a separate development hypothesis has been um, has been expressed and uh, laid out, and this <coughs> is a possibility that we need to reckon with. Uh, however, there are many phenomena like transfer and code switching that are suggestive of separate but related systems. Uh, we've talked a little bit about code switching and the structural aspects of code switching two or three videos ago, so if you want to catch up on that, go back to that video. Um, this relates to the idea that we have separate but related systems um, <clears throat> expressed, for instance, in the so-called interdependent development hypothesis. <clears throat> okay, uh, back to input for a moment. Um, when a child grows up with several languages, the input that this child hears will determine which language will become dominant. Um, as I said, the dominant language can be responsible for a number of transfer effects, so that language B is used in a way that is a little funny from a monolingual perspective, but actually motivated from a perspective of someone who knows both language A and language B. Let me give you an example. So uh, let's say we have a Spanish-English bilingual. Um, in Spanish, subjects don't have to be expressed. Yeah? So you can just say rains instead of it rains. And yeah? English, subjects need to be expressed. That's a grammatical constraint. You can't really get around that. Of course, there are contexts in which we have utterances that formally lack a subject. But still, in most contexts in English, subjects are expressed, whereas in Spanish, there's relatively great liberty to not express a subject overtly. Now, when you have Spanish-English bilingual children speaking Spanish, uh, they have a tendency to express subjects more often than monolingual Spanish children do this. And this can be interpreted very well as an effect of English being more of a stickler with regard to subjects. Yeah? So we have one language that says you always need to express the subject, and you have another language that says, well, you can put it in, you can leave it out, it's, it doesn't really matter. Um, from the child's perspective, it's desirable to have a single rule rather than uh, two separate rules. And so they will be influenced by the English rule that says, okay, put the subject in always. Um, here's an interesting study <clears throat> that shows that bilingual Spanish-English children actually have a tendency to use more overt subjects, whereas monolingual uh, Spanish children use fewer overt subjects. So the monolingual children, they acquire the adult uh, Spanish monolingual standard more quickly than the bilinguals. The bilinguals eventually get there, but you see in these uh, line graphs which show developments over time that uh, at some point the bilinguals are actually at a rate of something like 50%. So half of the time they put the subject in, half of the time they leave it out in Spanish. Yeah, And um, the, the monolinguals they never even reach 30%. Yeah. <clears throat> so eventually they uh, end up at something like 20%. The bilinguals, they stay higher than that throughout um, the first couple of years. Okay, um, now, by the way, this was a study uh, just on the basis of three children. And you might say, well, is that really great evidence? The problem with uh, studying bilingual children is that comparing them is really not that easy. Yeah? So for one thing, you have different language pairs. Can you really compare 
a bilingual child who's speaking English and German to a bilingual child who speaks English and Chinese. Um, can you compare uh, bilinguals who speak two languages with similar typological characteristics or uh, languages with completely different typological characteristics. So there are SVO languages such as English, there are SOV languages such as Japanese. Um, that will of course play a role with regard to the systems that these children uh, that these children create. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are also differences in language mode or in the complementarity of the domains in which uh, children use their different languages. So is the child always in an environment that would trigger bilingual mode? Is it living in a bilingual community or is it alternating between different monolingual environments? Let's say the school environment is monolingual and the home environment is monolingual but the languages are different. That will be a different kind of way of being a bilingual than if you're in a community where everyone speaks different languages depending on what contexts uh, they find themselves in. And of course there are differences in balanced. Uh, so is the child a balanced bilingual speaker or is one language dominant? In most cases one language will be dominant but even there there are degrees. Yeah? So is a child reasonably balanced or is a child very much dominant in language A and language B is just something that they speak to a little extent. Yeah, so one grandma who only speaks Norwegian. Yeah. <clears throat> that will lead to some sort of bilingualism, but not to the same extent as in other cases. So all of this makes it difficult to find subjects that uh, can give you reliable input for studies on first language bilingual acquisition. Doesn't mean that it can't be done, it just means that you have to be aware of the limitations that come with the territory. Okay, let's talk a bit about speech perception in bilingual infants because speech perception and the acquisition of a phonological inventory of a language is one thing that uh, belongs to the first important steps of acquiring language. And one development that children undergo during the first year of their lives is that they turn from uh, what has been called linguistic citizens of the world to culture-bound listeners. So linguistic citizens of the world are, well, babies who can listen to just any language and discern different sounds, different shades of uh, noise, if you like. Whereas we as adult speakers have become culture-bound listeners, we've become hardwired, more or less, to the phonemic differences that are present in the languages that we actually speak. Yeah? So when you, have, when you suddenly hear a new language as an adult with a very subtle distinction between two sounds, Chances are you won't even hear it, but to a speaker of that language, this difference is actually very, very important and even phonemic, so that two words with just this little difference mean different things. Right, so as I said, at birth, babies can distinguish between all different kinds of linguistic sounds. They're very sensitive, and as adults, we have become used to the phonemes of our language, and we have a hard time distinguishing similar sounds that speakers of other languages hear as different. Let me give you an example. So English distinguishes R and L. So um, <clears throat> uh, the word rap means something different from lap. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, we don't really make a phonemic difference between aspirated P as in um, uh, ping pong, yeah, and uh, a non-aspirated P as in sports. Yeah? If you want to, you can do this at home. So <clears throat> take your hand and say ping pong and you hear a little puff of air against your hand. If you say sports, there's a much weaker puff of air. So that's the aspiration that's just missing. Um, now, to speakers of English, there's a clear difference between R and L. And there's no big difference between aspirated P and non-aspirated P. Um, this isn't the same 
across different languages. For instance, Japanese doesn't make a phonemic distinction between R and L. These are two sounds that uh, represent different ends of a spectrum that's actually a unified whole. Yeah. And uh, Koreans find it funny that English doesn't make a phonemic distinction between aspirated P and non-aspirated P. For them, in Korean, we have minimal pairs with aspirated P, non-aspirated P, uh, where two different words with these sounds actually have different meanings. So bottom line, languages group sounds differently into phonemes. And one job that you have as a half-year-old child is to figure out, okay, what sounds in the language that I'm hearing are actually phonemic? Which are the sounds that are responsible for meaning differences? Yeah, that's one thing that you have to figure out, and babies do this, yeah? So there is interesting research um, being conducted with something that's called a head-turning paradigm, uh, where children listen to sounds and sound differences, and if they manage to successfully identify a sound difference, they are given a reward. Yeah. So how can you reward a baby? You can't give it cash, you can't give it uh, food. Um, I mean, you could, but I'm not so sure how happy the parents would be. Um, so what's being done here is that we have a baby, so look at the uh, upper panel of the picture. There's a baby sitting in the lap of uh, uh, his or her mom. And uh, the baby is being entertained by an experimenter with a stuffed penguin. Okay, so this captures the uh, attention of the baby. And uh, the crucial thing is that at the same time as this happens, the baby hears sounds over loudspeakers. So in that room, there's a loudspeaker and the loudspeaker plays things like ra, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's interesting for one second. And then the baby goes, okay, I've heard that, uh, and turns to the penguin instead. Now, at some point, uh, the sound switches from ra to la. And whenever the sound switches, there's something interesting that happens uh, to the other side of the baby, namely uh, the, the, the box that you see there uh, in black in the upper panel and uh, lit up in the second panel. So there's, there's a panda banging a drum. And so there's something interesting to see whenever the sound changes. So the baby is trained, conditioned if you like, to turn its head towards the box whenever the sound changes from ra to la, or from la to ra. <clears throat> right. Um, so there's an incentive for the baby to do that, to learn that, uh, because uh, this is obviously fascinating when you have a panda banging a drum. I could, I could look at that all day. Um, but it's not easy. Yeah? It's, it's a challenge for the baby to do this. And so <clears throat> um, you see that the mother and also the experimenter, they're, they're wearing these um, yeah, this is this, this ear protection, and uh, that's because they're not supposed to hear the sounds ra or la because they might influence the baby or, or turn it around to look at the panda, and of course, that's not what you want as a researcher. Okay, so, um, what's the point of this? The point of this is to see whether the baby can hear the difference between ra and la. And as you might expect, babies can do this. Yeah, they are very sensitive listeners. And uh, more often than not, they also manage to turn their heads whenever there is a change in sound. So let's look at the graph right here. So this is an experiment that has been done with monolingual American babies and monolingual Japanese babies. And uh, you see that here are results for the American and Japanese babies at six to eight months. So when you do this kind of experiment with a six-monther, um, they will turn their heads at the right moment um, about 65% of the time. Yeah? So that's not a bad result. That means that babies can actually do this. Now, the interesting thing is when we compare these results here, six to eight months, to results that are obtained at uh, 10 to 12 months. So 
four months later, um, another set of babies are brought into the lab, are put on their mom's laps, and the same game happens over again. So you see that at 10 to 12 months, the American babies are actually at something like 75%. So their skill of uh, distinguishing Ra and La has increased. And the Japanese infants, what's up with them? Yeah, so <clears throat> they are actually doing worse. They can still identify the difference um, better than chance. So they're at something like 60%. So that means that, yes, they do hear a difference, but less so than their uh, American peers. Why is that? The answer is there's this difference because the difference between Ra and La, between R and L, is phonemic in American English, but it's not phonemic in Japanese. Okay, so the American infants have been paying attention to this difference between R and L in their language because there are words with different meanings where the only difference is R and L, and such words don't exist in Japanese. Okay, so as you learn a language, you're being trained to pay attention to phonemic difference, and the flip side of that is that you become sort of insensitive to uh, sound differences that are not phonemic in the language that you're learning. So fascinating, but also slightly depressing news uh, from this head-turning paradigm experiment. Right, um, we'll come back to this in the context of bilingual kids who do the same thing. Now, um, does the development towards culture-bound listeners work differently in bilinguals? How does it work when you are a baby and you hear a bunch of different sounds, and not only in one language, but actually in two languages? We can imagine that this makes the task of coming up with a phonemic inventory much harder. Yeah. So we'll look at a few studies that have investigated this. So bilinguals and their sounds. Uh, monolinguals are exposed to a single set of phonological sound categories. So if you're a baby and you learn English, you uh, learn that there's a phoneme a, uh, as in cat, hat, fat, man, and so on and so forth. You learn that there's an e, as in beans, see, hear, be, and so on. Uh, there's an u, as in you, to, shu, new, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, bilinguals, well, they also hear sounds, um, but sometimes they hear sounds that are sort of similar to these English sounds, but uh, seem to fall into a different category. So French has a, has a phoneme that is not part of the English phonemic um, inventory, namely U, as in tu. Yeah? German, of course, also has U. And, um, okay, little anecdote, uh, <laughs> there's uh, research that suggests that Germans are grumpy uh, because they have lots of front-rounded vowels which force you to make sort of an angry face, uh, like this, when you, when you make an U. Uh, well, uh, funnily enough, no one ever has said, okay, the French, they are so grumpy because they have, have these U sounds. Um, there it seems to be something different. So this whole thing is to be taken with a grain of salt. But let's get back to bilinguals and their sounds. So in uh, French has U, which is, if you look at a vowel space between English U and E, um, <clears throat> so it's a high vowel, not front, not back, but in the middle. Right. Um, now, as an English monolingual baby, you would hear lots and lots of words that have an E, and you would hear lots and lots of words that have an oo, but you would not hear lots and lots of words that have something in between. Okay, so e and oo are reasonably different. You can distinguish them rather well, but of course not every e and every oo is realized in exactly the same way. So that's why uh, these uh, sounds are 
<clears throat> represented in this distribution-like fashion here. So most E's are right on target, but then there are some extra fronted E's and some not so fronted E's. Uh, most O's are here at the back and some are even further back, but some of them are, are more towards the middle, so they sound more like U. Yeah, so some dialects of English have U fronting, so you say food instead of food. Uh, so this happens and the child hears that, of course, but there are very few elements uh, that really sound like U. What the French English French bilingual baby uh, hears is something well like the E and U distribution, but suddenly in the middle there are all these U's. And so you can imagine when you're exposed to this kind of distribution, it's much harder to say that, okay, there are three different sounds. Here, it's very clear to see that there are two sounds that are different from one another, and uh, that's how I can distinguish them. Here, there are much greater areas of overlap and it's harder to see different sound areas for these different phonemes. So the bottom line is for a bilingual baby uh, there's a much higher risk of there being great areas of overlaps in the sounds that they hear and so it's more difficult to come up with a phonemic inventory. <clears throat> Here's a empirical study uh, that sort of works like the raw la study that I explained a couple of minutes ago. Uh, here we're dealing with babies that are Spanish Catalan bilinguals and uh, they didn't hear ra la but they heard uh, through the sound uh, loudspeakers the words dudi and dodi. Okay so it's basically the u and o uh, phonemic contrast that the babies had to listen out for. So the speaker went doody, 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 and then suddenly doody, and that's the moment where the, the panda or whatever else uh, would appear in the box, make an interesting sound, and the baby should turn its head. Now, both languages, Spanish and Catalan, have the distinction between U and O, and we'll come to the exact point of this experiment uh, in just a moment. So again, the uh, distinction that was made was between two groups, uh, one group of four-month-olds and one group of eight-month-olds. And uh, there were monolingual children <clears throat> in Spanish and Catalan, respectively, and bilingual children in Spanish and Catalan. Um, and the question was, okay, do the four-month monolingual babies discriminate between O and O? Do the bilingual four-month-olds uh, discriminate between O and O? What about the monolingual eight-month-olds? What about the bilingual eight-months-old? Is there any difference between these four groups? Yeah, so here are the results. So we first look at the four-month-old monolinguals who make a distinction, yeah? So you can see um, how much attention, uh, how much time the child spent uh, looking at, at the panda, and uh, the attention is greater when you have a switch. Yeah? When something interesting happens, the child is more likely to look at the panda, and that's what we would expect. So this is what we would expect of monolingual citizens of the world. Switches are interesting. Um, also, for the bilinguals, this is the case, yeah? So no difference here, as we would assume. Uh, at four months old, regardless of whether you're a bilingual or a monolingual, all kinds of switches are being registered, are being noted as interesting. <clears throat> um, now, when we look at the eight-month-old monolingual culture-bound listeners. These kids have learned that, okay, in my language, there's actually a phonemic distinction between U and O, and so this is a switch that I find interesting. Yeah? So here we actually replicate the same kind of behavior, more attention to the panda when there's actually a sound switch. The interesting thing is the fourth condition here, the eight-month-old bilinguals, who show no difference between the switch condition and the same condition. And this may raise the question, okay, why do the bilingual culture-bound listeners 
not discriminate between Dudi and Dodi as well as the other three groups. Well, the answer seems to be that Catalan has several OO-like vowels so that the bilingual children who are becoming sensitive to these phonemic distinctions actually face the problem of a crowded vowel space. There's lots going on. It's hard to distinguish the uh, phonemic differences. And because discriminating these vowels is more difficult, uh, they fail to invest all of the attention that the other groups invest when there's a switch from U to O. Right. Um, a second variant of the experiment uh, replaced the UO contrast with an UE contrast. And lo and behold, when the contrasted vowels are very different, such as U and E, then also the eight month old um, bilinguals and monolinguals behave in exactly the same way. <clears throat> right. Okay, summing up, um, speech perception in bilingual babies. All babies growing up face a common task, namely they have to figure out what are the sounds of my language that differentiate between meanings. So uh, we learned that M and D are different phonemes because there's a word mama that means one thing and there's a word dada that means another thing and the consonant quality between m and d that difference is the only difference between those words bilingual babies have a challenge namely the more languages a child acquires at the same time the more sound categories there are and the sound categories of one language sometimes overlap and cross-cut with the sound categories of another language. And the question then for the baby is, okay, where exactly do you draw the line? What are the categories that we have to form? So in a nutshell then, um, bilingual acquisition can delay the acquisition of the phonemic inventory. Phoneme learning can be delayed in bilinguals. <clears throat> okay, last issue for this video, do bilingual babies babble in two languages. Do you not only speak different words, but even before that, when you have sort of proto-language in babies, is babbling going on in different ways in different languages? So is there evidence for language differentiation even before the baby learns uh, its first words? And do babies babble differently depending on who they are with, if they are in a family where one caretaker speaks one language and another caretaker speaks another language. <clears throat> the method that was used to investigate these questions were uh, an analysis of, of longitudinal recordings of a bilingual child named Brian, who had an English-speaking mother and a French-speaking father, and Brian was recorded twice a month at 10, 11, 12, 13, and 15 months of age, and during these recordings the researchers managed to capture some 560 utterances in total, so utterances that has to be read as babbling that Brian produced, um, out of which 289 with the mother and about the same number of tokens with his father. And then these babbling utterances were analyzed with regard to syllable structure. Um, okay. So, what were Brian's syllables like? The researchers annotated the number of sounds per syllable, so how many phonemes, yeah, just one phoneme, that would be a, uh, la, that would be two phonemes, uh, bap would be three phonemes, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Uh, they also calculated the ratio of consonants to vowels per syllable. They counted the number of just pure vocalic syllables, the number of CV syllables where we have a consonant and a vowel, something like ba. Yeah? And here they counted separately the number of stop plus vowel syllables and the number of approximate plus vowel syllables. And they also counted the overall number of open syllables, that is syllables that end with a vowel. Okay, and uh, the analysis shows quite nicely that these features are different for English and for French. Um, so if you look at the, the, the numbers in this table, it, uh, it appears that Brian produces longer 
utterances in French. Yeah, so English <clears throat> has a lower mean number of syllables per utterance, uh, has quite a lot of monosyllabic utterances and not so many polysyllabic utterances. Um, French, uh, when Brian babbles in French, there are actually quite a lot of polysyllabic utterances, which gives you some clue uh, that even as a baby, Brian already has an idea what French is supposed to sound like. Yeah, He may not know the words, but he has an idea of the sound of French, what it's supposed to come out like when he's talking uh, to his dad. <clears throat> um, also with regard to the syllable structure, there is a difference, namely there are more uh, approximant syllables, so things like ra and la that start with an approximant and with a vowel um, <clears throat> only 8.9% in English but more than 20% in French. So this gives you an idea of the child monitoring what French words have as components. Yeah? Right, so coming back to the question, is there evidence for language differentiation even before the baby produces any words? And do babies babble differently depending on who they are with? The answer seems to be yes, they do. And that's kind of cool. Uh, Brian babbles differently with his mother and his father. And this is evidence that babies distinguish different languages already before they learn their first word. So even though the baby hasn't produced their first word yet, uh, they already have a good number of ideas of what this language sounds like. Okay, summarizing for today, um, bilingualism comes in many different forms and shapes, and even bilingualism from birth, so bilingualism in first language acquisition, can work in different ways. <clears throat> there are transfer effects that suggest that uh, BFLA is the acquisition of two systems that are different but related, that interact, that allow for uh, transfer from language A to language B. So the dominant language has a greater likelihood of influencing the less dominant language. Uh, with regard to sounds, between 6 and 12 months of age, babies acquire the phonological systems of their language. And um, <clears throat> bilingual input poses a particular challenge to the baby. Uh, overlapping phoneme boundaries may lead to delayed phoneme learning, but eventually, of course, the babies figure that out. And there is even evidence for bilingual babbling, that is language differentiation, before the first birthday of the child. All right, um, that was it for today. Au revoir. See you then.